In 1991, an ear, nose, and throat doctor by the name of Alfred A. Tomatis published a book called Pourquoi Mozart, or Why Mozart, where he documented his experiments while trying to cure ailments like dyslexia, ADD, autism, other learning disabilities, sensory processing issues, along with general motor skill difficulties, uh, as well as fighting depression, improving on-the-job performance, making somebody more creative, and even giving the listener the ability to learn foreign languages faster. Tomatis believed that a number of these issues began while the ear was forming in the womb, and if that person's ear had any issues developing properly, then the individual wouldn't be able to hear their mother's voice voice and would end up developing communication issues, which Tomatis believed to be the potential cause of all these ailments. I'm not gonna lie here, I don't really understand all his work, mostly because it's not true and it's all been disproven. But in 1993, there was a study by Rauscher, Shaw, and Kai. Key? who tested the effects of listening to Mozart on an individual's spatial reasoning. The researchers gave the participants the spatial reasoning portion of an IQ test while under three conditions. First, the control, a subject would take the test in complete silence. Second, the subject would take the test while listening to verbal relaxation instructions, which I don't really know what that means. And third, they had the subject take the test while listening to Mozart's sonata for two pianos in D major. They found that the individuals who took the test while listening to Mozart would generally score higher. However, the effects that Mozart's music had on the subjects were temporary. They would only last while the subject was listening to Mozart, and even then the beneficial aspects of Mozart would only last about 15 minutes. But in 1994, a New York Times music columnist by the name of Alex Ross wrote an article stating that researchers had determined that listening to Mozart actually makes you smarter. At which point a lot of people started to actually believe that listening to Mozart would result in a general increase in IQ. But it wasn't until 1997 when Don Campbell published a book called The Mozart Effect, Tapping the Power of Music to Heal the Body, Strengthen the Mind, and Unlock the Creative Spirit. And in this book, he talked about how music composed by Mozart can have general benefits to mental function and overall increase to your IQ and that you have to play Mozart for your baby so that you can benefit their neurological development. And this is really frustrating because aspects of these studies are true and come from the right place, but none of these individual studies have really honed in on what's happening in the brain. And at the same time, there's some serious cultural exploits taking place here that would make a story like this not only believable, but extremely profitable, especially in America. See, America has always had this fascination with Europe. Like, how many times have you heard of a college student taking a semester to travel around Europe, and then they come back and suddenly they're all enlightened and high and mighty? Well, that idea goes back to the 1800s America. Way back when, if you wanted to be educated, especially in the arts, you had to travel to Europe and learn from the European masters. That meant that if you were part of the upper echelons of society, you probably spoke more than one language, had a degree from a European college, and had pen pals in Europe. Uh, anything else about Mr. Candy that I should know before I meet him? Yes, he is a bit of a Francophile. <laughs> what civilized people are, and, <laughs> and he prefers Monsieur Candy to Mr. Candy. Si c'est cela qu'il préfère. He doesn't speak French. Don't speak French to him. It'll embarrass him. But after the world wars and all of Europe bombed itself into smithereens, America, as well as all the other former European colonies, i.e. the rest of the planet, kind of took one long look at Europe and started to question the cultural superiority that Europe had held over the world for the last few hundred years. At which point you start seeing more and more people staying in the states to go to school, and along with the massive economic boom of the 1950s, you start to see New York and LA become massive cultural centers of the world. But we still have that highly romanticized idea of Europe. Like just think about how crazy people go for the Renaissance Festival, or like how a lot of people in the States will use the Eiffel Tower as a romantic symbol. So if you take a prolific European composer, it'd be pretty easy to convince a lot of people that there's something super high class and special about listening to someone like Mozart. And Mozart was no slack. He was a child prodigy and toured all over Europe giving concerts while he was still a child. He wrote an insane amount of music over the course of his very short life, and he was one of the first freelance composers who ever lived. One time, when he was 14, he listened to Gregorio Allegri's Misere? Misere? He listened to a very important piece of music at the Sistine Chapel on Easter. It was a special piece that they performed on Easter, and back then you could only perform a piece if you had the score. And the Catholic Church kept this score for this piece under lock and key. So the only way you'd be able to hear this piece is if you were at the Sistine Chapel on Easter. Well, while on tour, the 14-year-old Mozart heard the whole piece, and that night, when he couldn't sleep, he wrote down the entire 15-minute piece of music, note for note, from memory. The following day, he returned to the second concert to make sure that all the notes were correct, and sure enough, there wasn't a single mistake. Now, since Mozart had recreated the score, the piece wasn't special anymore. The secret was out. Mozart was kind of like the first ever musical pirate. 
But instead of excommunicating him, Pope Clement XIV awarded Mozart the Order of the Golden Spur, which... I think technically makes Mozart like a Catholic knight or something. I don't know. So Mozart was totally a musical badass, which makes sense as to why so many people might think that his music has some sort of supernatural power to it. But you have to realize that this is the same guy who had a romantic relationship with his cousin, had a serious poop fetish, like used to send really gross letters to his cousin, like as a romantic gesture, and she'd be really gross and send some letters back. But then Mozart also sent like poop letters to his dad. And then Mozart got back at his crush by marrying her little sister, instead of his cousin and they stayed married until he died so is that the guy you want being the role model for your kids i don't know but as far as classical composers go Haydn really made more progress for the world of music over the course of his lifetime i mean we don't call him the father of the symphony for nothing but i'm getting distracted okay like i said the most frustrating part about this phenomenon that we call the mozart effect is that it actually works listening to music composed by mozart can actually make you smarter. And it's all related to this picture. Twice a year, right around finals week, I have to see this stupid picture on Reddit claiming that you should study while listening to video game soundtracks because there's something about video game soundtracks that provides a stimulating background that doesn't mess with your concentration. I don't know what a stimulating background soundtrack means. I don't know how to write stimulating background music. And if any type of music is supposed to just sit in the background, then what's the point of having it? But the worst part about this picture is an element of it is actually true. So buckle in, because we're going to have to get into some neuroanatomy. Okay, so there are these two areas of your brain called the Broca's and Wernicke's areas. The Broca's area is here, and it's responsible for speech production. And the Wernicke's area is here, and it's responsible for speech comprehension. If either of these areas are damaged by stroke or by some traumatic injury, it leads to a condition called aphasia. A person with Broca's aphasia will understand language, but will have difficulty producing the words. This is called expressive aphasia. And what did you used to do? Um, well, um, worked um, on a desk, um, seven, seven sales, sales and worldwide and very good. Yeah. And a person with Wernicke's aphasia will be able to produce words, but they might not maintain any type of meaning. This is called fluent aphasia. What are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talk with the people up with them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. They'll save in the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. This is actually the backbone of a lot of music therapy. Music therapists will use a variety of techniques to help a patient use other parts of their brain to compensate for what has been damaged and help them regain their ability to communicate. Now it's really important to understand the Broca and Wernicke's areas and what they do because they play a key role in something called subvocalization. Subvocalization is what your brain does when you read a book. In short, it's the voice that you hear in your mind when you're reading a book or thinking to yourself. When that word in that book makes a sound in your head, it's your Broca and Wernicke areas producing that sound. But if there's someone talking to you, it overloads those areas of your brain and your brain is forced to pick only one task to work on. That's why libraries are quiet. If people are talking around you and you can tune into their conversation, your brain literally isn't powerful enough to read and listen to the conversations happening around you unless you can focus hard enough and have your subvocalized voice be louder than the people around you. That's why coffee shops are so nice for studying and focusing. There's already so much noise that your brain can't focus on any single conversation, so you can focus on that subvocalized voice in your head. But all of that goes out the window when you put in your earbuds and start blasting Taylor Swift. Let's have a test. Here's a stock sound of a coffee house that I found. You can pick out my voice super easily because you can't really tune into the other noises. That's why something like rain is so peaceful. It creates a consistent backdrop for your inner voice. But if I start playing Taylor Swift, suddenly it's a nightmare to try and focus on my voice. The relative volume doesn't really matter, it's just too difficult to keep track of both things. So that sigh you just let out when I turned off the music was because you were taxing that part of your brain and it was stressing you out. So if a game wants you to try and focus on a puzzle, they won't be playing music with lyrics. In fact, music with lyrics will only appear in cutscenes where you aren't really doing anything. Or maybe those lyrics appear in a language that you don't understand, so it just sounds like voices singing and it won't interrupt the dialogue. So if you're in a room trying to solve puzzles, maybe talking to the test taker will constantly break their focus, making it difficult for them to think. And taking the test in 
absolute silence might bring more attention to the test taking conditions and have every cough and dropped pencil break their focus. Meaning that listening to music that doesn't have lyrics that happens to be composed by Mozart would allow them to focus better and maintain their concentration and ultimately increase their test scores. So when you look online and find charts that correlate your favorite type of music and the average SAT score, and you see that the highest test scores all happen to listen to Beethoven, maybe it's the fact that those kids can focus on their studies because they're listening to music that doesn't have lyrics. Or maybe it's because they have the type of parents who are so desperate to give their kid an edge on the SATs and get into a good college that they force their kid to listen to Mozart or Beethoven because a news article or a chart on the internet said that it might give their kid an edge. But maybe those parents are also the types who would buy their kids practice tests and send them off to private tutors. Maybe these parents are so desperate for their kids to succeed that they go as far as to micromanage what music their kids are allowed to listen to. So if you're trying to study or you really have to focus on something, listening to music that doesn't contain lyrics or at the very least contains lyrics in a language that you don't understand can help you eliminate any potential distractions. And in turn, maybe that helps you retain more information for that next test and you end up getting a higher grade all because of what music you were listening to. So, can listening to music composed by Mozart make you smarter? Yes. But by that logic, so can listening to all the battle themes from the Final Fantasy series and the soundtrack to The Dark Knight. <laughs>